All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to MS Neuro TV by MS Views and News, sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene. We're glad to have so many of you joining us here today. My name is Anna Fernandez de Castro, and I'm the Assistant Development Coordinator over at MS Views and News. MS Views and News is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing education and information to the multiple sclerosis community. Today, we're thrilled to welcome back Dr. Aaron Boster as he guides us through disease progression and how to monitor, understand, and discuss MS progression with your healthcare team. Dr. Boster is a board certified neurologist, systems medical chief of neuroimmunology, and director of the MS Center at Ohio Health in Columbus, Ohio. He knew he wanted to become an MS specialist since he was 12 years old, as he was raised in a family with MS. This personal connection inspired him to dedicate his career to helping people who live with MS and their families. So first, we'll begin by playing a 12 minute interview with Dr. Boster. And once the video has finished, Dr. Boster will be available for a 15 minute Q&A with all of you attending today. We just ask that you please keep your questions on topic and complete the quick survey at the end of the webinar. We'd like to thank Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene for making this program possible and for supporting our MS community. Okay, let's begin. to MS Neuro TV, presented by MS Views and News. MS Neuro TV is a comprehensive educational program bringing together MS professionals from across the United States covering the topics that you want to learn more about. To register for MS Neuro TV webinars, visit www.msviewsandnews.org. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the program. Dr. Boster, what can you tell us about disease progression? How do you know if a person is worsening? How does the patient know if he's, he or she is worsening? Stuart, you're touching on the holy grail of multiple sclerosis, progression. In order to understand progression, we have to take one step back and first talk about an important term called worsening. When we say worsening in the context of multiple sclerosis, what we mean is the neurological examination is worse. It's not as good as it used to be. So I saw you in January, and now I'm seeing you in March and there's a hitch in your giddy up. You're having trouble walking. Something's worse. And that's a very honest term because we don't necessarily know why you're worse. You could be worse because you had a clinical attack and you haven't fully recovered. And that's one way of getting worse, incomplete recovery. But when you get worse in the absence of an attack, that's the definition of progression. And really when it comes down to it, it's what we want to stop or reverse. Now, we don't have the end-all cure-all, but there are many things that we've found that in fact slow progression. And in my mind, it's all about being four for four. I tell people in my clinic, I want you to be four for four. Number one, take an MS disease modifying therapy and make sure it's working. How will that help you? It's gonna decrease or hopefully stop new MS attacks and decrease or stop new spots. And we know that new MRI lesions and attacks later downstream increase the risk of progression. And so that's important. Number two is to not smoke cigarettes. Smoking speeds up multiple sclerosis and, and speeds up progression of disease. Now the good news is not smoking slows it back down. And so it's imperative that our patients attempt not to smoke. The third thing is to stay physically active and to exercise. 
Exercise increases BDF. Exercise increases brain volume. We think that exercise in many ways is neuroprotective and it's almost like its own disease modifying therapy. I can't stress the critical importance of staying physically active. The last one is supplementing low vitamin D. It turns out that levels of vitamin D less than 50 tend to drive the disease faster with an increased risk of progression. Now the good news is levels above 50 seem to slow it back down. Monitoring progression is not easy. We can identify when a patient tells us that they're failing the litmus test of life. Hey doc, I used to be able to walk to my kid's soccer game, now I can't make that walk. Uh, you know, I get caught up in the grass, I can't go that far. You can learn from history what you're, something that sounds like progression. As I mentioned earlier, you're gonna to try to look for it on examination. Now there's different ways of doing that. It turns out that things like the timed 25 foot walk are very, very sensitive quick measures and correlate very strongly with progression. And so there has to be a way in clinic, both by listening to the human and by watching and examining, that we can identify when they're worse and hopefully clarify if that's attack or progression. Excellent question. Do you recommend that they journal what's going on with themselves? Um, how, do you, how do you find out for sure, other than using MRI, what else do you use to keep tabs on disease progression? A person with MS benefits from being aware of their disease state. Uh, you and I both embrace MS education, and I think we both share the opinion that the more empowered, the more educated the human being is, the better job they can be at a partner in their own care and helping themselves. And so the question of how do you track what's going on is a very, very real one, and it's not a straightforward thing to do. The most simply, I think that you wanna keep a journal. You wanna write some things down. You hear something, read something, see something, you write it down and bring it to your doc's attention. You notice something. I saw double vision the entire evening. What's up with that, doc? Write it down. At bare minimum, I think keeping notes and bringing those notes to your clinician is a critical way of starting to become aware of what's going on. Now in the modern era, we can get fancy, right? And we have an app for that. And there are now mechanisms by, with, with uh, apps on smartphones which you can very quickly use to document things that are going on during the course of your day, how you're feeling, what's going on, if there's new uh, physical limitations, cognitive limitations, et cetera. And so some patients have chosen to use the app in, instead of keeping, but, but the point here is, I think at the time you're noticing something, you wanna stick it on a piece of paper or somewhere so that you can then reflect on it later. No matter what is going on, uh, I notice a progression in MS patients. It typically takes them, in my clinic, about one to two years to start to really gain insights into what's going on. And when you, when you look at someone that's had this disease for a while and they started to understand it, they can tell the difference oftentimes, attack, pseudo attack, deconditioning, infection. And it's really awesome to help take care of someone who has reached that point where they're starting to really in, inform what's going on in the clinic and more importantly in their own life. Dr. Boster, can you please tell me about MRI and the benefits of MRI versus not taking this and how often one should have an MRI. The MRI is our most valuable biomarker. Biomarker is a way of learning about the disease before it's clinically relevant um, or in a, in a non-invasive manner. We use the MRI biomarker in two key ways. The MRI is critically important in diagnosing multiple sclerosis. In the modern era, we don't have to wait after the first attack for the second attack to decide they have MS. Back in the 80s, that's what we had to do. Someone would have an attack and we'd say, all right, well, call me if something bad happens. And then we'd wait and wait and wait. And if another clinical event happened, we could make the diagnosis. When we first started to use the MRI to look for spots after the first attack, what we found was we sped up the diagnosis times three we were able to make a much quicker diagnosis, which then turned around and allowed us to start therapy sooner and had better outcomes. Now, since the advent of the MRI, we have continually revised the diagnostic criteria, becoming more and more subtle in how we use it to make the MS diagnosis. Critically important and very, very helpful. Once we've made an MS diagnosis, we start a human on drug, and now we're trying to slow the disease down, the MRI biomarker takes on a completely different role. Now it's being used for disease therapy monitoring. So oftentimes a patient will say to me, doc, I feel great. I really don't want to get an MRI this year. Can we skip it? And I tell them, that's exactly why I want to get an MRI. 
If you're having clinical disease activity, I don't need a scan to learn that you're not doing well. I don't need a biomarker. I can learn from you. It's when you look and feel awesome that we have to take a check. And oftentimes I think of it as like the mechanic that's looking under the hood of the car. You know, and he calls you, he says, hey man, your timing belt's about to go. We gotta replace it. And he says, I didn't notice anything. He says, yeah, and I don't want you to. I'm gonna replace it before it fails on the freeway. What the mechanic was doing in this example was he was finding a, a preclinical car problem and taking care of it ahead of time. We use the MRI in the same manner. When that person with MS feels and looks awesome and we get the scan back and they have new spots despite being on a drug, that's breakthrough disease activity. Not clinical disease activity, but radiographic. And it was discovered on the MRI. We have learned that new spots on the MRI when you're on a drug predicts that you're not gonna do as well downstream. And that may be enough of a reason to switch drugs. In our clinic, it often is. And so in summary, the MRI is a critical biomarker. It allows us to rapidly diagnose and to monitor the success of drugs as we move forward in time. How best do you have the patients communicate with you or with your healthcare team? MS is a team sport. It's a village. And it, it, takes, it takes a group of people to be successful. Some of the key team members are the human being with MS and their care team, their providers. Now, the way I think about this partnership, what do I bring to the table? I read books that, that they didn't. It doesn't make me better, it doesn't make me smarter, but I know some stuff that might help out, and I bring that to the table. What do they bring to the table? Well, they bring them. They know them better than any other human being. And together, we can do awesome things. But we can't do awesome things if we can't communicate, right? And so learning how your doc wants to receive information, how your care provider best learns from you, is a reasonable question. How do you want me to contact you? Conversely, the doc learning how the patient best receives and learns information is critically important. I'm of the opinion that everything that we do in clinic needs to be written down. Clinic is a very, very intense moment. It's a half an hour. Typically, there's a lot of emotion build up. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of learning. There's a lot of really big words. And it can be overwhelming and scary. And even if you feel like you're fully understanding, all too often you could leave the room and think, what did we just do? Why did he want to do that? And so I think that one form of communication, which is really necessary, is to have written versions of what you tell the human. That way when they're at home, reviewing it with their family or thinking about it, they can go back and look at it. I think it's very important. I also think that it's important to look someone in the eyes in clinic and tell them what's going on. For example, when I get an MRI of a patient, it's with a great joy that I show it to them. We gather around the computer and we look at it together and we talk about it. A different, a different element of communication, I like to call being real. We're trying to live our lives. We're trying to work, we're trying to go home, we hope we get lucky every once in a while, we wanna eat a good meal. We're just trying to live our lives. And that's true for the doctor and the patient also. And so being a real human being, genuinely sharing, both doctor and patient, I think is really, really important. I, I mentioned sex just a second ago, and it's really important because it's a taboo topic, and yet it's a major driver of quality of life. I need my patient to feel comfortable telling me, hey, I'm having a problem in the bedroom. And I have to be comfortable receiving that information and talking about it, being real. I can't stress the critical importance of communication if you're gonna be successful in any team, particularly in this MS team, in this village. Dr. Boster, thank you very much. All right, so now we'll move on to our Q&A and interview with Dr. Boster with your own questions. If you have any questions for Dr. Boster, please go to the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen and type your questions into the question box. If you do not see the control panel, click on the small orange arrow on the upper right corner of your screen to make it available. Your questions will remain anonymous as I relay them to Dr. Boster. Okay, so let's get started. And Dr. Boster, thank you so much for joining us again today on MS Neuro TV. We're glad to have you back. Thanks, it's my pleasure to be here. Great, thank you so much. All right, so our first question for today is, how long does it take for brain lesions to light up on an MRI after a relapse? 
So that's a great question, and really it touches on this entire concept of activity. So activity we define as either a clinical relapse or a new or enlarged white spot or an enhancing spot, like you're talking about. So the, the correlation between when they happen is uh, within days to weeks typically. Um, if you have a new neurological deficit, so you have a new difficulty with vision, uh, it hurts when you move your eye and you can't see out of your left eye. Presumably, if we got an MRI, we would see enhancement of the optic nerve. And that enhancement will stay lit up, if you will, for on average two to four weeks, typically not longer than four weeks. Um, I will tell you, however, that it's not always as clear cut as that. And there are times where a person has a legitimate MS attack, and yet if you get an MRI, you don't find a spot. Conversely, someone can have a new spot that lights up on their MRI and not have a clinical attack. And we call that the clinical radiographic paradox. In other words, they don't always line up one to one. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, I have a similar question also um, related to um, MRI and, and progression. If a disease modifying uh -huh. therapy has been working well for years and no new lesions have shown on an MRI, should I be concerned if I suddenly begin to experience a symptom for weeks that I haven't felt since I was diagnosed about 10 years ago? Could this indicate progression? So the first part of the question is, if you have an old symptom that's come back for a couple weeks, should you be concerned? And the answer is yes, you should be concerned. In fact, if you have any new neurological symptoms that last longer than a 24-hour period or old neurological symptoms that have been gone for a long time and come back for longer than 24 hours, I feel that you are obligated to call your MS provider for an urgent visit. Now, I don't mean emergent, like go to the ER. I mean like be seen that week by the neurologist. Now, as described, that does not remotely sound like progression. Progression is typically defined as the worsening on the neurological exam in the absence of an attack or new symptoms. And oftentimes, uh, oftentimes progression will be a more slow, insidious decline. People frequently cannot pinpoint when they weren't able to walk as far as they used to. It's something where they say, you know, a year ago, I was walking a mile a day with my wife after work. And, you know, six months ago, I was having trouble doing it. And now I, re I really can't get that far. Um, and, and so uh, the second part of the question is that does not sound like progression to me. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can primary progressive MS include sensory symptoms such as numbness and burning? Heck yeah, it can, and oftentimes does. So primary progressive multiple sclerosis tends to have more spinal cord involvement than relapsing or remitting MS. And, and I say tends because, you know, there's exceptions to every rule. But on average, a person with PPMS, primary progressive MS, will have more spinal cord involvement. Frequently, when the spinal cord is affected, we have sensory symptoms. Uh, and that can be numbness, burning, aching, icy cold feeling, tingling. Um, it's, the commonality is that they're abnormal sensations. They don't feel normal. So the answer is a resounding yes. I will share, though, that that doesn't mean PPMS. So having a sensory symptom is not diagnostic for primary progressive MS. It can be seen in relapsing forms of MS as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Boster. Um, our next question is, my, my neurologist feels like I went from relapsing remitting MS to secondary progressive MS when I switched from one medication to another, and now he won't treat me with anything. What do you recommend for me? I recommend you find a new neurologist immediately. So neurologists are like plumbers or carpenters. There's good ones, there's bad ones, there's ones that we get along with and ones that we don't. And if it is your desire to be treated for your multiple sclerosis and your provider doesn't want to do that anymore, that's a real disagreement. I'm of the strong opinion 
that we treat people with so-called secondary progressive MS. Let me explain why. People with any relapsing form of MS, including secondary progressive MS, are at risk for attacks. People with secondary progressive MS are less likely to have an attack, but they still can. However, in my experience, people with secondary progressive MS oftentimes don't bounce back from the attack as well. So even though the likelihood of an attack is lowered, it's still possible. And so if it's still possible, I want to treat you. Moreover, these drugs, these disease-modifying therapies, particularly some of the newer ones, have been demonstrated to do things to progression, like slow it down considerably, and they also have been shown to do things like decrease the shrinkage of the brain. That has nothing to do with attacks. And so I think that it's imperative that we continue to successfully treat people as sort of an insurance policy against bad things. Think about it this way. I happen to have high cholesterol, so thanks, Mom and Dad, and I take a cholesterol pill every morning. Would I stop taking my cholesterol pill because I haven't had any heart attacks or any strokes and now I'm 60-something? Of course not, because if I stop taking my cholesterol pill, my risk of high cholesterol leading to a stroke or a heart attack increases. So I take a cholesterol pill and I plan to take it until I die. My advice to you is get a new neurologist. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Boster. Um, the next question is, what are the latest disease-modifying dr treatment drugs that you are most excited about? So I am drawn to um, highly effective therapies. Um, and I, I feel that way because I make my decisions largely based on efficacy. That's in the forefront of my mind. If we were in the fields of oncology, and I asked a patient if I could please use the fifth best drug available to treat them, I, I think they would tell me no. And similarly, in the setting of MS, I want to apply the most effective drug possible that the person I'm working with is comfortable with. And I really stress that sentence because just because I want to lead with a high efficacy drug, it, it, it's only going to work if the person I'm working with is comfortable with that side effect profile. That being said, Recently, several high efficacy drugs have come to market and they are really attractive to me because of my desire to use high efficacy drugs. So for example, we now have in the MS armamentarium a drug called Alentuzumab, codename Lemtrada, and another drug called Ocrevus, um, which is Ocrelizumab. And these are two infusible monoclonal antibodies that have very, very high efficacy. And so I those are two new drugs that I'm rather excited about. Great, thank you. Um, is there such thing as having too much vitamin D? Yes, so vitamin D um, will maintain a blood level and we typically get vitamin D from the sun. So for those of you uh, listening to this call in sunny Florida, I'm super jealous. I'm up here in Ohio where there was snow today and we don't have a lot of sun up here. And so oftentimes, we'll, when we check vitamin D levels in people with MS, or just people, we find that they're low. Uh, and it turns out that lower levels of vitamin D drive the disease faster. And so there's a desire to supplement vitamin D, not by tanning, but by swallowing a vitamin D3 pill. And it's D3, not D2. So you want to take D3. And we do this by checking blood levels. So we can check a blood level of the vitamin D. And our, my goal for my patients is that they're between 50 and 100. And I determine if they're between 50 and 100 by checking a blood test. If they're over 100, that's too high for me. And there could be bad things that could happen with extremely high doses. So the take-home message is, if you have MS, I think you should make sure that your vitamin D3 level is, or excuse me, that your vitamin D level is elevated above 50, but below 100. And how do you do that? You ask your MS provider to please draw a vitamin D level so you can figure out what the level is and how much vitamin D you need to take. Great, thank you. Um, what is your opinion on hydrotherapy on progressive MS? Are there any downsides? So when you say hydrotherapy, are you talking about like water aerobics and 
spending time doing water activities or is it a different kind of therapy? I want to make sure that I'm, I'm addressing the question properly. Let's assume um, that's what they mean. Um, okay. If someone who's asked this question, if I'm butchering what you're asking, um, please jump on the line or type it in and we'll, we'll continue to talk about it. I'm going to interpret the question as, is there value in water-based therapy? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes, yes, yes. Aquatic forms of physical therapy and exercise are awesome in MS, and I'll explain to you why. If your legs are weak and they're not strong enough to support you on land, in the water, and particularly in the water with a life jacket, you're much more buoyant and you'll be able to walk in some cases when you wouldn't be able to walk out of the pool. That allows you to exercise your legs in a way you otherwise simply wouldn't be able to. Number two, if you're unsteady on your feet and let's say have a tendency to fall to the left, in the water, the water pushes back to the right. And so it helps you maintain balance in many respects. Spasticity, which plagues many people with MS, tends to calm down in the water. And if you get overheated while exercising because you're raising your core body temperature, the water will pull the heat away from your body by convection. And so water therapy is really absolutely fantastic. I remind you that I want you to be safe in the water. I wouldn't go um, doing water therapy without a buddy, and I wouldn't do it without a life jacket if there was any concerns. Great, thank you. And our final question for the night is, what are your thoughts on cryotherapy or is this going against disease-modifying therapies? When you talk about cryotherapy, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of cryotherapy. Uh, people do various things, but, but I, the question, I need a little bit more information uh, before I can say anything intelligent. Do we have any, we don't have any clarification to help guide us. Okay, um, can our asker uh, please uh, rephrase the question? Well, just add a, help me understand exactly what she means by cryotherapy so that I answer correctly. You know, while, while we're waiting for that, um, I'll just say a couple comments about progression. Okay. We, we have inadvertently done a disservice to people with MS by creating labels such as relapsing or remitting MS and secondary progressive MS. It gives the false sense to both patients and clinicians that there are stages of MS like cancer stage one, cancer stage two, and that is false. We now have very clear understanding that people with relapsing forms of MS, even young folks that were recently diagnosed, can have periods of progression. We also have evidence that people that have been suffering from progression can have new acute bouts of active inflammation, attacks and new spots. And so, by labeling someone with a label of secondary progressive MS, uh, as we heard in the question uh, earlier this evening, and having a clinician have the audacity to say, we don't need to treat you because of this label is nonsensical to me. The reality of the disease is much more complex and there are no stages. And moreover, these medicines help decrease relapses, help decrease spots, and most importantly, help decrease brain shrinkage and progression of disease. And so I recommend that we roll the term secondary progressive MS up into a ball and flick it at the provider. And instead, we recognize that we have multiple sclerosis. If you've ever had an attack, then it's called a relapsing form of MS. And if you're currently in a progressive stage, you call it that, relapsing MS with evidence of progression. But that doesn't mean that you're done responding to therapy. It doesn't mean that we're done fighting. It doesn't mean that we can't still see improvements rarely and certainly have an opportunity to slow this disease down. So progression is not a dirty word, which means we failed and can no longer treat the disease. That's simply not true. And I implore you, if you're listening to the call and you're dealing with progression, don't stop fighting. I can give you example after example from my own clinic over the last decade plus where people that had progression were able to ameliorate their situation by exercising, supplementing their vitamin D, stopping smoking, and maintaining their disease-modifying therapy. And this is what I want for people that are listening in. 
Great, thank you so much, Dr. Boster, for sharing all this valuable information with us and for being so involved in the MS community. Well, as and, I like to um, say, we, we have mm -hmm. MS. Yeah, so thank you so much again for, for joining us and we can't wait to have you again next time. It'll be my pleasure. Have a great night and everyone be safe. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you so much. And we'd also like to thank all of you who have joined us today for our fourth webinar of MS Neuro TV. We'd really appreciate it if you could please complete a brief survey that's gonna pop up at the end. Your feedback is really important to us so that we can continue to customize our events around our viewers. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, May 8th at 8, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We will be welcoming back MS neurologist, Dr. Donald Nagroski, as he gives us an overview on injectable MS therapy options and their efficacy and safety. We'll keep you all updated this week through email and Facebook to let you know as soon as registration opens. If you would like to watch a recording of today's webinar, a video will soon be uploaded on our MS Views and News YouTube learning channel. So please don't forget to subscribe to stay updated. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information on our events and what's new in the world of multiple sclerosis, please visit us at www.msvn.org. And we'd also like to give a big thank you to Sanofi, Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene for making this program possible. And again, Thank you everyone for joining us here today. We'll see you all next month.